there you go the meeting is being recorded and we'll pause that later on when we get to talks which won't be recorded in the meantime it's time for me to hand over to the first speaker who is paul hallett from the university of aberdeen and he's going to be giving us a presentation on uh, roots as architects of soil and soil as architects of roots so if paul can have a go at sharing his screen and We should all be able to see that now. So I'll hand over to Paul for the next 15 to 20 minutes. Thanks, Paul. Hey, thank you very much, Tim. It's great to see so many people have made this meeting. I think this is the biggest attendance we've ever had for a metal lecture. So the virtual environment is working quite well. Um, this is the title I gave to Tim, I think a long time ago before we delayed the meeting. And I'm gonna cover half of it, I think, on roots as architects of soil. Soil as Architects of Roots is a big topic of our research at the moment, um, but I'll let the students who are working on that introduce that um, through posters and other means. But this is the last talk um, we will have when the Rhizosphere by Design project is running. So that ends early June this year, and Maria Marin is currently um, finishing off um, some of the final experiments on that. And we had various other people involved in this project, including um, Tim and Laurie from James Hutton Institute, Glenn Ben Goff from University of Dundee, and then Tina Roos, Nicole Kubernick, who I've seen on this cell, Ruiz, and Laura Cooper from the University of Southampton. So I'm just going to give an overview of some of the findings from that um, project, which go all the way from basic lab studies out to the field. So some of you will have seen this slide before, I've shown it quite a bit, but it is basic proof that roots have a huge impact on the soil physical environment. They are able to push their ways through obstacles, they regenerate structure, and they create that unique zone that we'll all be familiar with, which is called the rhizosphere. And they can generate pore structure over time, which is a massive impact to how soils function and how they behave. Something which I think will be followed on through a lot of the talks you're gonna hear this afternoon. But let's go in and we'll first of all look at an individual plant root and think about what is it doing to the soil as it's growing through it. So we've got different growth stages within it from the uh, root cap through to the elongation zone up towards maturation. And right from the beginning of time, we end up with mucilage being created at the root cap. Further along, we get um, um, ex exudates being put out from the elongation zone. And then finally, root hairs developing in the soil. Now, it's not just an impact of the root itself. There's also an impact of microbiology driving the way the soil forms. And all of this then leads to soil structure formation. And plant breeders have the capability to manipulate a lot of these properties. And that's really what we're trying to focus on. So whether it be exudation, whether it be these root hairs, and then what are the impacts that that has on soil structure formation, which could then be used to either improve plant performance or to improve the properties of soil as well. So if we think through at time and we just go through to that first time point where we've got that root cap exuding mucilage into the soil, it serves a lot of different functions. And one of the things that we discovered through a PhD project by Eud Olegay is that it actually makes it easier for the root to push its way through the soil. So this is a model study using chia seed mucilage, which is uh, very commonly used and, um, and also taken from the groups in Germany, but it shows mucilage concentration on the x-axis and then cone penetration resistance on the y-axis. And if we look at the black dots, which is basically what it's like um, just when it's added, you can see that with added mucilage, that penetration resistance drops down. And if we put it through cycles of wetting and drying, it drops down even more and the structure is formed. And this makes it easier for the root to push through the soil. And if we take a simple model of root growth, we can see that the elongation rate can be increased quite substantially over time because of the presence of this mucilage within the soil. If we go through a bit further where we've got exudates being pumped out within the elongation zone, these can also have a major influence on soil physical behavior. So one of the interesting findings, I think, from this project 
was that whereas we tend to think of exudates as these kind of aggregating materials which form this really nice soil structure, we actually found they may do that or they may do something else. They may actually disperse the soil. So this shows results using chia seed, which is in uh, purple and blue, which I discussed in the previous slide. So this is the model uh, mucilage. And then the black is a control with nothing added to it. And then green is maize. And you can see that also has resulted in a slight increase in strength. So the y-axis is the yield stress, and this is a measurement of how strong the soil is. So maize makes the soil stronger, but what's much more interesting is that barley, so this is collected from hydroponics, actually weakens the soil. And there'd be many reasons why an exudate may want to weaken a soil. It may disperse and liberate particles, thereby releasing nutrients, or it could also be a physical mechanism to drive the initiation of aggregation and um, improve the way that the root is manipulating the soil. Now, if you're a microbiologist, you're gonna be looking at this and you're gonna be thinking that is too phytocentric, which is one of the comments we had from reviewers when we put this proposal in, and you're totally right. So if we go through and we look at time a bit more, those exudates are quickly consumed and changed by microbes. So again, we look at barley at the top, and this is simply the same conditions, but we either tested it right away or allowed it to decompose for two weeks in the lab. And from this, you can see you've got this initial dispersion, so the soil becomes weaker with barley exudates added to it. But then after it's been decomposed, it becomes strengthened. So we've got a dispersion followed by a gelling, whereas in the maize, it gels it together really well, the microbes consume these compounds and they were left with less of it in a slightly different form. And it goes from jelly to a bit less jelly. But it does describe the soil structure that generates as roots grow and as it matures over time. Then if we look further on, we can think about root hairs. And root hairs, you can study incredibly easily just through a visual examination. So these are just images. These are from uh, McCulley, who gave one of the previous um, metal lecture talks. And you can see just from these photos, this huge impact on soil structure because of the presence of roots and the presence of root hairs. These are images from Glyn Van Gogh and they're of mutants of barley. On the left, they have no root hairs and the right, they have root hairs. But just looking at this, not taking any fancy measurement or anything else, you can see that there's obviously a really huge impact on soil structure. So with Nico Kubernick, we did something that I think we were having a beer once and joked that it was show off science, which was we used a synchrotron where we could go in and visualize individual plant roots. And then we could go in at micron resolution and look at how is the soil structure altered around that plant root. So we grew the plants in very small scale specimen um, holders, and then we imaged them at very high resolution when they were quite young. And then we could go through to these images and segment out the soil that was very close to the root, which I've just labeled as orange here, and also the soil that was further away from the root. So basically from the rhizosphere further out. And if we look at what happens to the pore structure in those two different zones, and we compare on the left, a plant with no root hairs to one with root hairs, you can see that the structure does start to change. First of all, with no root hairs, there's a slight bit more compaction caused by the root, but also when we have root hairs, there's greater variability in soil structure. And you can see that the pore structures are starting to be pulled together. Um, so they're much more similar than they are without the root hairs that are present. This is for one study we decided we'd go back in and do it again. And when we went back in and did it again, we actually found there was no impact of root hairs on the soil structure within um, the specimens that we're looking at. And in the, um, this paper, New Phytologist, Nico went into great depth to describe how the packing arrangement of soil particles around the root might've been creating certain artifacts that would be driving these similarities between um, roots 
that have root hairs versus roots that don't have root hairs. Now, what I've shown you so far is limited to the lab. It's also often limited to quite young plants or exudates that have been extracted through approaches like hydroponics, where we may have artifacts induced. Now, obviously, we need to check out what's happening in the field. So an experiment that was set up um, really under Tim George's guidance and by Maria Marin and also Mohammed Navid and Lori Brown looked at the performance of these cultivars out in a field experiment. And this is right behind the building where Tim might be sitting at the moment. So on James Hutton um, land in Dundee. And we looked at a sandy loam soil and a clay loam soil that were within the same field. So they're just at different locations along the slope. So on the left, we've got all these different um, shades. NRH is no root hairs. BRH is a bald root hair. SRH is a short root hair. WT is wild type. And SASI is a KWS variety, which has very prolific root hairs. And if we look at the um, graphs we've got here, which show the root hair length, for the different, cult different cultivars or genotypes, you can see that what's being measured in the lab in terms of root hair length is quite robust out in the field. So this isn't an artifact that just is created in the lab and is only found in very young plants. We also can find the same traits when we go out to the field. So we're able to take the same uh, genotypes and use them for further study. We can also measure the amount of soil that remains adhered to the root. So this is the, the measurement of rhizosheath weight. It's a very simple measurement to then look at how much of the soil is being affected directly by that plant root and remains adhered to it. And again, you can see it's robust. So as we move towards these hairier roots that are more prolific, we end up having more soil that remains attached and is adhered to it. And this occurs over time as well. What we we're hoping to demonstrate from this field experiment, and we're still um, analyzing by looking at um, CT imaging and by looking at the physical data in greater detail, is a really big impact on the physical behavior of soil. On the left, this is water content measured at um, different depths within the field. And between the different genotypes, you can see that there isn't actually a really big impact in terms of water uptake. And this was an experiment that was done during a very, very dry summer. One thing that we did find, which Sorry, you'd expect. Just, yep. just one second, I'll just, uh, could, uh, could you make sure that you're muted if you're in the audience? So, uh, Kimo Jin and yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks Tim. Um, so if you uh, look at the image on the graphs on the right there, although we didn't find a direct physical impact yet, which we're still measuring, we could see that when we have more prolific root hairs, we end up getting greater phosphorus accumulation. And we also find that when we have these root hairs, it's also a favorable trait for yield. And we're trying to now unpick what was driving that. Was it due to just phosphorus uptake, or was there actually a physical impact of the root hairs on the behavior of the soil? Now, using data from, oops, using data from this field experiment and other um, data that we collected throughout the study, we also started to do modeling. And with the modeling, we were trying to find out what is the ultimate root type idiotype in terms of creating um, resilience to the environment, affecting soils, and allowing for improved resource capture, such as with phosphorus. And so the graphs that are shown here, these are simulations that were done by Sal Ruiz at Southampton. They show the phosphorus concentration and how it changes in the soil over time, assuming that no new phosphorus has been added to it. So we start off in 2003, which is this um, kind of yellowish line, and then as we move through time, you can see the phosphorus being taken up from the soil by the different genotypes. And the one that has the root hairs is much more effective at taking up phosphorus than the one that doesn't have the root hairs. So we've got this improved resource use efficiency as we're looking at this. This is a fairly sophisticated model, 
But one of the things that we really want to push towards is looking at how are different root traits generating soil physical structure. And that's from this basic understanding of the mechanical impacts, of the physical properties of the different exudates and mucilage, and also of different traits of roots, such as the root hairs and also root architecture. Now, we did try to, in a different study, start to look at how does soil structure get affected by biology. And this is a work at a small part in, it was led by Nick Jarvis in Sweden. And in this, we considered all of the different properties of soil that leads to soil structure genesis. And much of this is driven by plants. So plants provide the substrate that microbes then use, which also help to generate soil structure. And then through changes in water potential, changes um, in temperature and whatever else, and time, we end up having soil structure um, generating. Now, from this, um, we came up with a model to look at how different properties of the soil would then lead to soil structure developing over time. And if we look at the results here, we have different scenarios. So the scenarios are very high root vol volumes or very high root occupancy, very high earthworm turnover of the soil. So up to 12% turnover per year. And then also scenarios where we've got lower amounts of roots and lower amount of earthworms. Whenever you've got a lot of earthworms from the model, if we look at macro porosity as a, a, a proxy of soil structure, you can see we've got very rapid generation of soil structure. So it changes it very quickly. You'd expect that because of ingestion and casting production, which would change structure very rapidly. But over a longer period of time, over a longer period of time, we end up having soil structure generating through um, just the high root environment as well. And where we have fewer roots and fewer earthworms, that we've got the poorest amount of soil structure developing. Now, this was quite challenging to develop this model, but it is at least the first step towards this ability to um, make predictions of how specific root traits, environmental conditions interact with microbiota and soil fauna to then generate soil structure over time. So I think I've run out of time. So just to conclude, um, as we've known for a very long period of time, Rhizodeposits interact with root hairs and microbiology to form soil structure in the rhizosphere. And this soil structure is incredibly important to how these microbes function, but isn't always considered when we're looking at some of the processes that occur within the rhizosphere. What we discovered that was very interesting was this dispersing mechanism, which is uh, not that well appreciated, which could be at the onset of soil aggregation. And then as we get to later stages of aggregation, microbiology starts to dominate what we're looking at and possibly root hairs. And this needs to be unpicked a bit more. One of the most exciting findings is that between genotypes, we can select for root traits that may have different impacts on soil properties. And by selecting for these root traits, we've got an opportunity to not only target yield, but also to target soil sustainability at the same time. So at present, we've learned a lot about how roots influence soil physical behavior. We start to, we've started to learn some of the basic physical processes, but this is really just the beginning. And I think we'll see from a lot of the other talks um, coming up that there's still a long way to go, but we really have learned a lot over the past five years about how roots generate soil structure. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. That's great. So, Lynn, are there any questions? Uh, right, I've been seamlessly um, coordinating this, and thankfully it looks fairly easy so far. There's a question from um, Alessandro uh, to ask about dispersion and aggregation. Uh, what are the mechanisms going on in the rhizosphere here? Um, Alexandra is mentioning electrolyte concentration, pH, pore water, et cetera. Um, Paul, do you have some views on what's happening? 
Um, I think Alessandro's answered a lot of it, that there's quite a few different processes that are driving it. So the pH change is one direct chemical impact that will um, result in either dispersion or aggregation, depending upon which way it works. What I didn't have time to show was the uh, physical properties of the um, different exudates and mucilages that are added to soil. So some of them are viscous compounds. So they have a gelling capacity through that. Um, they're very surface active. So again, they'll cause poor water drainage and they'll affect um, interparticle bonding as well. So there's quite a few different mechanisms that have been driving it. And we have looked at the chemical characteristics of the exudates and picked out really organic acids having this huge dispersing impact, whereas longer chain polysaccharides having a much more aggregating impact as well. Um, and Adam's, uh, a couple more questions here. Um, Adam's asking about evidence for natural variation um, as opposed to, is there, is there evidence that natural variation as opposed to mutant will have impact in the kind of studies or models you have used? Um, so it's natural variation of root to... traits as opposed to using particular mutants where you've had stuff knocked out. No, there is some... Um... Yeah, please. So... <laughs> Sorry, Adam, do you want to... Yeah, no, it's the, I, I love the work, that, the mutant work. But it's a very it's a very stark genetic variation, and I guess it would have no place in a natural system because they would be disadvantaged in some way. But there will be variation in those traits, and is there any evidence that we can really select for them? So the um, yeah, so where we've got a positive result emerging is with the sassy variety that was planted out of the field experiment which is the one with the really prolific root hair. So that's the one that looks more like Glenn than like me. And um, it, uh, it is the only one that's actually starting to show an impact on soil physical structure formation. So I think within genotypes that are grown commercially, the wild type is optic, which is another, well, it was a widely grown commercial variety, um, is not showing the same impact that the sassy is showing. Um, and then also between different plants, obviously, there's huge influences. Yeah, I, mean, I think also, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Go, go, go. Yeah. I was going to also mention the, the work that Tim has done on in terms of looking at variation in uh, particularly things like root hairs in populations of the at um, JHI. As the chair, I can't, couldn't possibly say that. <laughs> you yeah. could possibly yeah. comment, okay. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we've, we've done quite a lot on variation in root hairs, but also more recently on mus on polysaccharide um, exudate concentrations and so on. So there's variation in that as well. So, so yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely diversity out there. So may, maybe Glenn will have one more question and then we'll move on to the next last, speaker. Last question comes from Marcel Bucher and it's um, how easy is it to generate reproducible quantitative data in systems with earthworms as variability between individuals is, is can be large? Can I pass this to Blair McKenzie? Um, but, um, so, uh, <laughs> um, I think in, in model systems, it's, uh, well, you know, where you add specific numbers and uh, have everything controlled, then you can get some reproducible um, results. I mean, if you're referring to the model um, that we had, then it's basically based on results from the literature and results from a Swiss soil observatory in terms of earthworm numbers and effects on soil. So there, you know, we're basically using mean values for those types of models, but there was extreme variability in the field for those as well. And I think that's um, one of the things that's not, I think appreciated enough in soil structure research is variability is actually a property of soil. So rather than trying to get incredibly tight error bars on everything, having a lot of variability can actually be what you're trying to test as part of the hypothesis. I don't know if Blair wants to add anything. Um, he's somebody who studies uh, earthworms much more than I do. Um, only that I agree with the general 
question that, that as soon as you introduce earthworms, you introduce um, you know, even if you even if you pick the right species and the right you know subspecies and and you have the right age groups and and they're all controlled for weight and the, uh, they'll do different things. So, so the, the ver you you do compound variability you know, exponentially as soon as you start putting earthworms into things. Okay. Well, thanks ever so much, Paul, and all the people who've asked questions. That's that's a great start to the to the afternoon. We'll move now on to um, to Ben Jackson. So he's already sharing. So that's great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, ben, are you are you happy for us to record this this session? Yeah, no problem. Okay, we'll continue recording then. And uh, over to Ben, who's from the University of Edinburgh, and he's going to tell us about some of the work that's happening there on nitrogen isotopes, microbes, and more. So pretty much everything by the sounds of it. So, great. <laughs> it's a Ben. Well, thanks very much uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm I'm sort of here representing the Edinburgh Plant Soil Systems Lab, um, which is a relatively new um, grouping of researchers bringing together uh, work ongoing at uh, the Global Academy of Agriculture and Food Security, where I'm based, but also the School of Geosciences. And we're sort of being brought together around a common set of approaches, especially the use of isotopes to try to understand plant soil microbe interactions. Um, and so I, what I've done is I've asked several members of the lab to just give me a few slides to help me describe to you what works ongoing in the lab at the moment as a way to sort of introduce ourselves to, to you, for those of you who don't know us and what, what's ongoing there. Um, so to start with, um, I will introduce Lorna Street, who has uh, been at Edinburgh for quite a while now, but her work revolves around how climate is changing um, the composition of vegetation in Arctic and upland ecosystems, and what influence this is having on uh, soil carbon dynamics. And her recent findings, oh, I should mention as well, that this, is, uh, this work has been done uh, through long-term collaborations with uh, Sterling, with uh, Jens Suk and Phil Wookie, who many of you may know, um, but Lorna's work has uh, provided in situ evidence from permafrost systems that vegetation influences soil carbon turnover through below ground allocation of photosynthates, and uh, that the vulnerability of soil carbon to decomposition and permafrost systems may therefore be directly linked to vegetation change, and that expansion of woody shrubs across our the Arctic could increase decomposition of old, older soil organic carbon. Um, and so the key part of this dynamic is that shrub species differ in their in these priming effects. And this is likely to do with differences in plant carbon allocation. And uh, some of uh, Lorna's ongoing work has been trying to examine these, get into the details of the differences between plant species using various techniques, including um, oh, I'm, I've completely forgotten the technique now. Anyway, I'll come back to that. But a key part of this dynamic is the probable link of the acceleration of soil carbon turnover because of increased plant nutrient demand, which suggests that shifts towards more productive shrub vegetation in the Arctic may ultimately result in loss of soil carbon with huge significance for uh, climate change and, and feedbacks to climate change. More recently, uh, Lorna has established some work in Scotland to try to look at the similar dynamics where um, planting or natural regeneration of native forest species in heath uplands may be causing this similar dynamics in Scotland. Um, so then moving on to uh, Han Zheng, who's a independent PhD student from China, working in the Global Academy. And his work is focusing on cover crops and what the legacy for soil carbon and nitrogen cycling they have. Uh, he's using a trait-based approach to understand the impact of the, the residues of cover crops uh, in terms of 
microbial sources of nitrous oxide emissions. So the starting point for this work is that there's um, obvious benefits to having cover crops, um, but there seems to be mixed evidence as to whether or not cover crops and the, in particular the residues of cover crops are resulting in higher nitrous oxide emissions. And of course, in China, with the huge nitrogen uh, consumption in by agriculture in China, this is a particularly important issue. And um, Han is interested in understanding the mechanisms under, underpinning how the chemical traits of different cover crops may be impacting how the residues are resulting in nitrous oxide emissions. And so he's doing this by using uh, nitrogen isotope labeling techniques in order to be able to explore the different microbial pathways that might be contributing to nitrous oxide emissions, but then is also trying to test the robustness of chemical trait emission linkages by looking at these emissions in different soil types and environmental conditions. Um, so his, he's really been having difficulty getting his first experiment underway because of the, um, the pandemic, but hopefully this should be kicking off very soon. And the approach he's taking here is to grow 15N labeled uh, cover crops, cereal rye, radishes, and uh, a vetch and to use these residues then to try to clarify the dominance of direct residue nitrogen emissions and looking to see whether or not this carbon to nitrogen ratios of these residues are having an impact on uh, on the emissions and then to explore if different carbon to nitrogen ratios will impact which pathway, which microbial pathways through denitrification and nitrification, or even through potentially nitrate ammonification may be resulting in these nitrous, uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Um, then moving, oh, moving on to a, a relatively newly funded project, which builds on a collaboration between uh, Professor Liz, Liz Baggs, Eric Patterson, Jill Cairns, and Christian Thierfelder. Uh, based in Zimbabwe and Malawi, the Africa Soil Project is uh, building on, as I was saying, building on work that's been done to look into the, the mechanisms underpinning how conservation agricultural approaches in smallholder, smallholder farming systems in Zimbabwe and Malawi are helping to build soil organic matter and soil fertility uh, to try to sh shift farming practices towards a more circular nutrient economy, but also now to try to help the breeders, in this case, Seedco and Agritex in Zimbabwe, to uh, breed for these management practices. So uh, a prior project uh, that a postdoctoral researcher Lambani Mwafulirwa worked on in, uh, in collaboration with uh, colleagues in Zimbabwe, identified two candidate genes for enhanced soil organic mineralization rates, sonic or soil organic matter mineralization rates, excuse me, associated with the regulation and release of soil exudates. So this work uh, looked at uh, quantified um, plant exudate transfer to soil and its subsequent mineralization in soil respiration. And um, this work is what's being used to inform the Africa Soil Project, which is essentially about up and outscaling these results to help breeders to identify uh, maize lines that are going to be optimal for inclusion in conservation tillage and cons uh, 
conservation, excuse me, conservation agriculture approaches in Zimbabwe. Um, then staying in, uh, in Africa and in smallholder farming systems, I'll now spend a little bit more time talking about the project that I'm currently involved in, which is the Legume Select project. Uh, and this is, again, a follow-on project that is taking, uh, that attempts to ameliorate a decision support tool called the Legume Choice tool to help smallholder farmers make informed crop choices. So the concept behind this is that uh, legumes have long been touted as uh, potential key crops for sustainable intensification of smallholder farming in systems that are inherently low input because of socioeconomic conditions. And the project is really uh, uh, multidisciplinary in its approach, ranging from participatory methods to understand farmers' needs uh, through to trying to use uh, big data and the ROMAS Rural Household Multiple Indicator Survey to get an idea of how people are using legumes and for what and what impacts those legumes may be having on crop yields and household uh, sustainability, as well as using various levels of uh, bioscience and field testing. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on the work that I'm directly involved in, which is largely laboratory based split between the James Hutton Institute, Edinburgh, and our colleagues at the University of Nottingham. And we're essentially, again, taking a traits-based approach to try to understand the interactions between legume grain crops and soils uh, using, in principle, stable isotopes, but also the X-ray micro-CT uh, scanning techniques uh, available at the Hounsfield Institute in Nottingham. And in brief, this is being done in, in three experiments. We're uh, using a, a straight screening approach in our first experiment to try to understand both the, the um, carbon acquisition, but also root traits that we think are relevant to these systems. And then in a se second step, we're using isotop labeling techniques. Uh, so uh, the first of these experiments has been completed where we've urea labeled foliage of legumes grown in the lab here, and then sent these uh, urea labeled systems, uh, mesocosms down to Nottingham and Nottingham have planted a maize rotation into these pots and the idea is to combine an, a nitrogen budget as established by the 15N tracing with uh, the micro CT work showing how the roots of the legumes may have structured the soils, leaving behind uh, potential root channels for easier root deployment by the maize and perhaps even maize, uh, um, organic matter foraging by maize roots. And then a second experiment that I'm just wrapping up now in terms of the practical uh, growth and labeling stage, uh, oops, is a 13C labeling experiment where we're making use of uh, continuous labeling facilities here in Aberdeen at JHI to allow us to label soil fractions and to understand both the rates of transfer of photosimulates and the fates of these photosimulates within the soil within soil fractions and all of this work uses uh, six legumes that have been chosen as being representative of the different uses that farmers wish to make of legumes, and the, the idea being that legumes themselves are not uh, are, are multifunctional for smallholder farmers, uh, and these we're, what we're trying to do with the traits approach is to link this 
these um, multiple possible functions that are, could be of benefit to farmers with root traits, and that these root traits may help us to understand the potential impacts and outcomes in terms of carbon and nitrogen cycling of, of, of the legumes in these systems. Uh, the, there is a field component to this, uh, the legume select project, and here's just to close, here's a, a picture of one of our field sites in Kenya with ongoing uh, field, uh, an ongoing trial where uh, best practices for the growth of these uh, legumes is being demonstrated to farmers. Because of course, very often, what farmers are able to do is limited by their, their availability of inputs. And so uh, a, a huge, um, what's the right word? Not barrier, but um, a huge learning curve for me certainly personally, but I think for the project as a whole, is the extent to which uh, soil, this, the circumstances that smallholder farmers are faced with are so suboptimal that, uh, for example, in, in our 59 labeling experiment, the, our, our, the soils that we took, ended up choosing were so uh, poor and so uh, acidic that many of the plants will, are, uh, were shown to be experiencing aluminum toxicity. and it's just uh, ex served to accentuate for me the importance of trying to understand the myriad factors at play at any one time. But certainly some of our early results are also hope hopeful in terms of indicating strong differences in response between legumes in terms of their ability to root when faced with the aluminium toxicity and the potential impacts on subsequent the subsequent maize crop. But yes, please watch this space. Uh, we will be glad to share our results as and when they come in. So I, I hope I've uh, not used up too much more time and be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. That's uh, great, perfect timing and um, really good good representation representation of the broad work, broad uh, range of work that's happening at, at, in Edinburgh. So, Glyn, any questions? There are a couple of questions so far. The first one's from David Baldwin. Um, and it's along the lines that I was interested as well. Um, he's asking about the carbon losses or increased carbon emissions um, from the soils with the planting of shrubs in the first study. And uh, he's asking about what is causing this. Is it to do with root decomposition or old carbon decomposition? Um, or is it um, changes in the soil physical conditions associated with the plants, for example, the water relations changing? Any ideas? I, I, I'm fairly sure all of the above. <laughs> I mean, it, okay. it's, 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 it's hard to, to I, I think it's hard to disentangle the, you know, thawing of permafrost uh, and the warming of soils, whether they're permafrost soils or not from changes in um, the hydrological cycle and balance in those soils to, um, uh, you, you know, you, you can imagine that the, the, the roots and the shrubs are potentially growing faster and thus respiring more and transpiring more. So there's, there's massive shifts and changes in how those ecosystems are functioning. Uh, and, and all of that is going to be key to that, but I, I shouldn't really speak to that too much because it's certainly not my area of expertise, but from having listened to several speeches, uh, several talks that Lorna's given, I mean, she's definitely seeing old carbon, greater than 50 year old carbon being decomposed and being made labile by the action of uh, new carbon inputs by shrubs. Uh, and that a lot of her ongoing work is focused on what the role of nitrogen is in in that dynamic uh, and she's interested in organic nitrogen so she's recently got, managed to get funding to have a hplc system in, installed and uh, she's developing capacity to look at the impacts of amino acids and organic nitrogen cycling uh, and certainly the conjecture is that increased nutrient demand is potentially resulting in old carbon being decomposed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, following on from that, Annette had a point along those lines, uh, thinking about if we're trying to sequester carbon, um, 
how important is it if we are matching particular plants to particular soil locations if we're trying to improve sequestration? I mean, I, you, Annette, you're hitting it, hitting the nail on the head. Absolutely. I think that's a message that's come through, at least to us researchers, pretty loud and clear uh, globally in the in the wake of the Tom Crowther um, study and uh, the trees are the solution and and the, the that huge wave and the. Abs, abs, adoption of that message by the world at large, and then the scientific community going, whoa, 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 <laughs> no. I, I think, yeah, it's absolutely clear. We have to be really careful about cho choosing, choosing where we are likely to have the most benefit, and also to avoid those areas where we may well have a negative impact uh, if we're planting the wrong species, let alone trees in uh, in soils that otherwise are huge stores of carbon relatively, and we don't want to be losing any of those. So yes, very important consideration. One final quick question. Uh, Carmen had asked uh, what class of genes were identified related in soil organic matter mineralization exudation? I do not have that information to hand right now, but I can try and come back to you, Carmen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thanks, great. thanks, thanks, Ben. That was great. Uh, we're going to move on to the next speaker now, who's uh, Grania L. Mountasir from University of Strathclyde, and she's going to share her screen now, I think. And um, yes, and it's engineering the rhizosphere for geotechnical applications. So over to uh, Grania. Can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. I'll share my screen. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm presenting today some of the work that we are doing at the University of Strathclyde, uh, myself and Professor Alessandro Tarantino, and looking at what we can do to the rhizosphere in response to um, geotechnical challenges. So I wanted to start off by just outlining some of the challenges that we face. Um, um, so we know, you know, everyone is familiar that heavy heavy rainfall can can trigger landslides, and that uh, this re results in around a thousand landslides globally each year, with uh, thousands of fatalities and billions of dollars in cost due to damage and disruption um, and reconstruction of our physical assets. And the underpinning mechanism for this is really that the infiltration of water uh, increases pore water pressure at depth, and there is an associated uh, reduction in soil shear strength. And so this means that a slope that may uh, be stable in partially saturated conditions can become unstable in saturated conditions. So another challenge that we face is breaching of flood embankments, and there are various mechanisms that can contribute to this. Uh, one of them is when a water level in the river rises and overtops the crest, and we can induce erosion at the toe of the landward slope of the embankment, and this erosion can progress backwards through the embankment, uh, forming a breach. But the striking thing about these challenges is the scale on which they occur. And uh, land scale, landslides can occur on a catchment scale. Uh, flood embankments um, in England and Wales alone, there are 35,000 kilometers of embankments. And so, but the, the, the techniques that we have as geotechnical engineers to, to mitigate slope failures are really targeted at small scale point by point interventions. And so what we're doing at Strathclyde is trying to first develop understanding of the performance of the existing rhizosphere in a, in a, from an engineering perspective. And then to also we're developing growth based interventions uh, that may be suitable for deployment at a larger scale. So I'll try to cover two different uh, topics in this talk. So the first one, I'll present a case study which uh, outlines the influence of the rhizosphere on the hydraulic response of soil and um, ultimately slope stability. And in the second part, I will um, present some experimental work that looks at the influence of saprotrophic fungi on soil behaviour. So there may be a few uh, 
participants today are living in Scotland and they'll be quite familiar with the Rest and Be Thankful case study. So it's a site located in the west coast of Scotland. And um, it's a site where landslides have been frequently recorded over the last 100 years in response to heavy rainfall. So Alessandro Tarantino uh, led this work. So they uh, characterized uh, the soil. So the first thing to note is that the bedrock is located around 90 centimeters uh, below the ground surface. And within that, there we have topsoil, so the rhizosphere, transition soil, and the, the subsoil. And so in the central plot, we have the green size distribution. And despite the fact that the topsoil, so the rhizosphere and the, the subsoil have a similar green size distribution, there is considerable aggregation in the topsoil, uh, which means that it's got a much higher porosity and a higher hydraulic conductivity, as shown in the plot on the right hand side. So Alessandro and the team attempted to, to model uh, water flow on the slope and the the slope stability, initially considering an infinite slope, so just a, a flat slope. Um, and it was quickly evident that the soil should not exist on that slope because it was unstable, and hence, but there is. So it became very apparent that the gullies that you can see from the photograph on the left hand side are really key in maintaining uh, stability in these slopes and they act to convey water down uh, the hill slope. What's also occurring is that the, the the topsoil with the higher hydraulic conductivity, so the kind of orange layer, is acting as a natural lateral drainage layer and diverting water into the gullies. And so to validate uh, the model that they produced, they uh, were able to reproduce uh, two historical landslide events, so one occurring in December 2011 and one in August 2012. Uh, by inputting the, the rainfall flux. And so we're showing here the, the evolution of the, the factor of safety. So that is the, the ratio of the available uh, shear strength to the acting shear stress. And when that becomes less than or equal to one, uh, the slope reaches an unstable condition. And that's the evolution here is shown with time and also with depth into the slope. And in both cases, um, the failure occurred at the interface between the bedrock and the soil, uh, and that was able and that was confirmed in the the field surveys that occur, that was undertaken after these landslide events. But what's really interesting um, that the modelling was able to highlight is that failure occurs uh, at this location when the rainfall intensity exceeded the drainage capacity of the rhizosphere lateral drain. So in this context, it's the high hydraulic conductivity of the rhizosphere is acting actually to limit vertical infiltration. And so it's maintaining lower pore water pressures at the soil bedrock interface until such a point as the, the, the rhizosphere can't contain any more water. So considering remedial measures at this site should really be looking to promote vegetation with shallow lateral root systems to enhance the drainage capacity um, of the rhizosphere and to enhance what, what, what is already there and what's already happening. So I'll just move on to the, the second part. Um, so this is work that I've been leading, experimental work where we've been looking at uh, saprotrophic fungal mycelia. So fungi are organisms that grow through the development of their of their hyphae, and these hyphae branch out and fuse together as the organisms are searching for nutrients in their environment. And I'm really interested also in cord forming uh, fungi, as these can forage for resources over large distances, over meter scale, um, and the resources that you're using plant litter, twigs, fallen logs. And from natural analogues, we know that these networks can occupy very large areas and they can be incredibly durable. And in fact, um, fungi in the forest floors of North America have been shown to be some of the oldest and largest organisms, uh, living organisms on Earth. So much of the results I'm going to present here come from the PhD uh, thesis of Emmanuel Salafu. And so we looked at um, we had sand amended with lignocellulose and treated with the pleuratus austriatus fungus, so the oyster mushroom. 
And we looked at that, the effect of that on the wettability of the soil. So you can see the top photograph is the untreated sand and lignocellulose where water infiltrates um, immediately within milliseconds and the bottom the treated where water droplets will maintain themselves on the, the soil surface for, for days for as long as we, uh, we left them. So what we've done this, we looked at the um, growth over a period of up to up to three months. And even after one week, we have created a, a water repellent soil surface. Um, and this is because the fungi, filamentous fungi, produce hydrophobins. And so the hydrophobins are self assembling at interfaces and converting an initially hydrophilic surface into a, a water repellent surface. And this, um, the water repellency exhibited at the surface was. Um, maintained for up to three months, uh, even in depleting moisture and nutrients um, in the environment. So then we looked at the, the, the influence of the fungal growth, uh, the pleuratus osteatus, on the infiltration behaviour. So we have these columns, sand plus lignocellulose, one untreated control and the, and the treated. Uh, this is a 30 centimetre column and we were we're conducting ponded infiltration tests, so a constant head of water of 25 millimetres above the soil surface. And we were monitoring with uh, tensiometers and theta probes, um, pore water pressure and volumetric water content in the columns. So here we have plotted the volumetric water content at point A for both columns, uh, and that's towards the base of the column. So for the untreated, which is essentially sand granular uh, soil, um, we had water reaching the base of the column within six minutes, so as, as you would expect. Whereas in the treated, uh, fungal treated soil, so the pleuratus osteatus here had grown for three months, and um, it took several hours for water to reach the base of the column. Um, and so we've delayed infiltration and also reduced infiltration. So we've also looked at the influence of uh, the fungal growth on erosion behaviour. And so here we investigated it uh, using the jet erosion test apparatus and that we developed at Strathclyde. So we have a soil specimen uh, within a tank submerged with water and we have, have a jet of water impinging on the, the soil surface. And so we're inducing scouring at the centre of the soil surface. So if we look first at the, the untreated results, so we have photographs and laser scans at the end of each stage. So if we increase the height of water in the jet tube, we increase the energy of the impinging jet. And so we progressively erode the soil. And so once we had applied a, a height of water of 500 millimetres in the, in the jet tube, um, all the sand in the untreated control had been completely removed, had been completely eroded. So if we look at what happened in the fungal treated um, specimen, so these were allowed a growth period of three weeks with the pleuratus osteatus. And we can see very clearly from the photographs that the erosion behavior is very different. Um, we are scouring immediately below and around the, the impinging jet. So we use the information from the laser scanning at the end of each stage to determine the volume of soil that was eroded. And so in the white symbols is the untreated soil, the green is the fungal treated after three weeks of growth, and we have the volume eroded on the y-axis and the, the height of the water in the jet tube on the X. So at 500 millimetres, we have eroded 100% of the, the control untreated uh, soil, Whereas in the, the soil that's been treated with pleuratus osteatus, we've only removed 3% of the soil. So we've significantly reduced uh, erosion. So we've also looked at the influence of the growth duration on um, the erosion behavior. So in blue, we have uh, soils that were treated with pleuratus osteatus and allowed to grow for one week, three weeks, six weeks, and nine weeks. And what we observed is that the three, six and nine weeks, they all performed uh, similarly. Whereas when only one week, when there was only one week of growth, um, the behavior was improved compared to the, the untreated sample, but not quite as good as what we get after three weeks. 
So if we have a look at what's happening to the soil microstructure um, as we are uh, growing fungal mycelium within it. So first of all, we start at the top with the untreated um, specimens. And so these are micro XCT images that have been thresholded here to show us the sand grains in the untreated and the lignocellulose. So you can see the large angular shapes of the lignocellulose. And this is, you can see in the untreated that we have separate grains and separate lignocellulose in the arrangement. In the treated, um, now we have this mycelium phase, which is connecting the grains together, binding them, um, and it's reaching between grains, so hyphae or, or aggregations of hyphae. Uh, and it also seems that we're infilling some of the, the smaller pore space as well. So these experimental results seem to suggest that the, the fungal mycelia can have, you know, beneficial characteristics within a, a geotechnical context. So for slope, they may be able to help to limit infiltration while simultaneously improving um, soil cohesion and resistance to erosion. So just to conclude then um, from the work presented today is really that the, the studies have shown that selection of remedial measures should uh, be based on a detailed understanding of site and the existing role of the rhizosphere um, on engineering performance. And uh, secondly, I've shown that saprotrophic fungi have some interesting, uh, induce some interesting modifications on soil that could be desirable for geotechnical applications. So the question there really now remains whether saprotrophic fungal activity could be promoted in situ via bio-augmentation or uh, via bio-stimulation of what is already uh, present in the rhizosphere. I'd just like to thank the researchers who worked in these projects, so Brunella Balzano and uh, Emmanuel Salafu. Thanks, Grania. That's a really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, so, Glyn, any questions? Uh, yes, we have a few questions coming in. Uh, the first one, I suppose, is a technical one uh, from Spenger, um, who asks, how, do you how did you determine the thresholds to segment the micro segment the micro CT images to distinguish between mineral particles and organic matter? So, uh, it was James Minto, a co-author um, and colleague at Strathclyde, who, who did the, the segmenting of the micro XCT. So the, the, the determining between lignocellulose and the sand grains in the untreated um, is it's fairly straightforward in terms of the density uh, attenuation. What's more difficult is in the treated. It's what I was showing there in the green is essentially the combined lignocellulose and the mycelium phase because I didn't have access to low phase contrast, uh, phase contrast tomography. So we use the existing XCT that we have at Strathclyde. And so we don't have in that system the ability to differentiate between uh, similar low density materials. Um, but I am aware and trying to get access to um, the CT scanner at Manchester in the new uh, facility that has the capability to do that. Uh, so presumably the soil is air dry, is it, or sand is air dry when it's imaged? Yes. Or, yeah. 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 Uh, I've got a question from Blair McKenzie, um, and he says that uh, different saprophytic fungi aggregate soil by a range of mechanisms are not all the same. So what determined your choice of the um, fungi? So we've used, we have used different um, fungi. I've only shown the Pleuratus austriatus uh, just now, uh, partly because it's one that everyone is essentially fam fam familiar with, um, and we've had good success in, in growing it in the lab and so forth. 
Uh, moving forward now, um, I'm working with um, Lynn Body at Cardiff University to source UK specific native species of fungi uh, that grow in particular um, environments. So ones that are known to grow in grasslands, ones that are known to grow in coastal uh, sand dunes and so forth. So it was really to get, yes, I would say that different fungi will have different influences. It was a, a way of starting the exploration, if, if you like, as to what, uh, these organisms can do, what modifications uh, they can induce in the soil. And I think that Sorry. covers a little bit of what Pete Headley was asking as well about sure. different fungi in different environments. Yes. Um, now, uh, a final question, I think, from um, Paul Hallett, and uh, he's wondering about have you explored um, preferential flow driven by fungi? and how that might influence slope stability. So, so that is something that, that would have to be um, considered. So there's evidence of that uh, within the infiltration columns. Um, so where you have uniform water uh, wet in front in the uh, untreated, the treated very much, there was a uniform wet in front for about 40 millimeters, and then it reached a patch of dense biomass uh, and water flow beyond that was really in the form of, of preferential flow. So that would need to be uh, considered um, in terms of modeling for, um, to determine slope stability and so on. Yeah, Great, thanks. Thanks so much, Grania. We'll uh, move on to the next speaker now. So it's Adam Price from the University of Aberdeen. And uh, he's gonna give us a talk on Rice roots for sustainability, genetics of root depth and biological interactions in aerobic versus anaerobic soils. So over to you, Adam. Thank you. Can you see my mouse? Yes. OK, OK, so look, um, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to use this as a sort of a, an excuse to give you a history of my work on rice roots, because I've been working on it for 30 years, <laughs> one month and two weeks, I think. Um, you so, only you only have fifteen minutes, Adam. So just, just so so. I'll it quite quick, and I'll keep my eye on the on the clock. If I sat on a train, which I'm not allowed to do at the moment, and and spoke to someone and said what I do, I would say I'm a rice geneticist. Um, so uh, that's the overlying uh, thing I do. But it all started with roots uh, thirty years ago, and I I want to put this into some context, which is the context of my rice research, really. It's about water and genetic variation, really runs through everything. So for, uh, for rice, it uses about half of all of the water that humans use. So it's, it's absolutely massive. And there are huge parts of the world, including parts of the world which grow an awful lot of rice where that water is not being used sustainably. So um, research focusing on using water less and, use, and, and considering drought has been sort of a principle issue running through my research and the other one is natural genetic variation i always show this slide because this is three proud uh, sri lankan gentlemen standing in front of a rice variety called nianwe which means in sinhalese drought rice so there are genes in that rice variety which make it somehow suitable for uh, production under a droughted system uh, i think that that's the assumption but my work has been looking at the sort of interaction of those two. So with that context, this is what I'm going to talk to you about. I try to get make everything begin with M. So I'm going to start off with mapping. So this is historical, where I started working on this thing called the Bala Azacena mapping population, which I created, uh, completed in 1995 using this crossing system. And the basic principle was they were both drought resistant, but Azucena has a deep root and Bala has a shallow root. We grew that in loads of different systems, hydroponics and sand and agar and rhizotrons and boxes and the field. Um, so uh, the upshot of all of that, which some, several of those were published, but the upshot of all of those, I think, comes is a, this is a nice publication for me where we put a lot of that together, where we try to map onto the 12 chromosomes of rice, where were the hotspots of uh, QTLs, quantitative trait loci, for different traits. So roots, roots on the right-hand side of the chromosome, 
and especially the original motivation was to link that to drought on the right, on the left hand side. And um, for example, there's a very strong QTL for roots on chromosome one here, but it doesn't really impact drought. And that was the, one of the main messages really that um, roots and drought didn't seem to overlap. And maybe one of the most important messages of my early, at least my early research career is think about soils. So this was an opportunity to study the soil hardness using a penetrometer showing two sites in Africa where we did drought experiments. And this shows the depth to uh, three megapascals, really hard soil. And in this area here, for example, you can see um, only 10 or, 20, 10 or 20 centimeters of the soil was less than three megapascals in hardness. And this is where we did our drought experiments. So you can't expect to find a relationship between drought and roots in a soil that sets like concrete. So soils are important. Um, this is just all of the root QTLs we found in that study. And um, there are some, uh, some really fantastic uh, QTLs here. Some of them have been used for breeding deeper root systems. Um, we've never really got to the bottom of the genes underneath those uh, because we had grants put in that were never funded. So we, we've never really bought them out, but we got some excellent candidate genes and auxin I think is still very much up there as potential candidates for, for a lot of these QTLs for root traits. I'll very briefly mention that some of these drought QTLs are not root QTLs. So this one here, we think we've got beautiful evidence, which we haven't yet published, that this QTL highlighted here is to do with hydraulic conductance of the root system. We've been working on this for years, haven't published anything yet. And I hope to find time, some time to write it up. We've done a little bit of work on methods. Well, I could I could speak for hours about methods for root screening, um, but I want to just talk about the herbicide method, which has been introduced into this uh, lecture series before. But my favorite method of all is this one called Rhizotrons. And this is a beautiful study, if you, especially if you're working on roots. This is freely available booklet showing you all kinds of root screening methodologies. But in, in this one, my favorite is Rhizotrons. Um, but we've we've used a lot of different screening method, methods. So this is my favorite, really quite cheap. Rhizotrons allow you to see the root systems. But even rhizotrons, I, and this is so nice. So you have, you have, the rice is beautiful in this sense. You have this very clear distinction in the deep rooted vertical systems of black gora, for example, and shallow rooted IR64. Very clearly visible in very, in quite simple screening systems. Um, this graph I like from this study, which is comparing different systems, because this is root length in rhizotrons versus root length in hydroponics. And you can see the relationship is reasonable. It could be better, but there are very clearly some cultivars that do much better in, in hydroponics than they do in, in rhizotrons. And we don't know why, so it would be nice to know. I want to talk about this development of a herbicide method. It's a very, very simple concept. You get a box, put a little bit of soil in the bottom, you, you soak filter papers with this herbicide dyer on, and then you bury more soil into it. Then you wait until herbicide systems develop. Um, you can see these herbicide scores, black gore are deep rooted check dies. Five means dead. IR64 is uh, much less affected. So it distinguishes between deep and shallow roots quite nicely. And um, if we do a PCA of rhizotron traits to herbicide, what we see is this herbicide trait here is very closely related to root traits rather than shoot mass, for example. It's very much related to root depth. And, our, and this methodology can pick up some of our QTLs. This is our favorite QTL on chromosome nine. We pick this one up very easily. Um, we've got a really strong root growth QTL in rhizotrons. We don't pick up with the, with the herbicide methods, so it's not exactly the same, and we don't really know why. But this is another example of using it. This is a study of genetic variation in Sri Lankan cultivars. You see here 135 Sri Lankan cultivars, very different herbicide scores. So this is Mayuri who did this study. Um, Black Gora is again, was dead IR64. 
not dead. Big differences between them. And Mayuri also did Rhizotron, so this is a comparison of the herbicide score against Rhizotron uh, visible root length and root angle. And you see this is such a beautiful correlation. One, one of the things I really like about this correlation here is it showing Nianwe. This is the variety I mentioned at the beginning. It's a deep rooted drought resistant cultivar. Um, we also can compare that to performance in the field. This is a study from um, coordinated by the International Rice Research Institute on 20 diverse cultivars. I'll go through it ever so quickly, but they grew a whole load of uh, rice varieties in multiple sites around Asia. Some were droughted, some were not. And sometimes you get a correlation. So this is in uh, Bawali is a place near Bangalore. This is yield under water conditions compared to the herbicide score, and there is no relationship. But when you look at yield under drought, you get a nice strong relationship. In other sites, you do not get this, and that I am sure is related to soil physical properties. So uh, that leads on quite nicely to the next theme, which is muddying the pitcher soil hardness. Um, I, I'll remind you what we're trying to do is relate to performance under drought, really improve performance under drought by looking at roots and root depth. This is the machine that we use to root, measure root depth penetrometer. What it can give you is this kind of thing. This is, this is showing you soil depth and uh, soil penetration resistance. This is a typical, this is in Italy, a, and a typical paddy field has a plow layer. It gets really hard and then it gets softer again. And if this exists, it's quite, it can be very hard for a root to get through it. This is it. This phenomenon is illustrated quite nice with a, a project with me and Paul Hallett uh, and work done by Claire Brown. Shows uh, rhizotrons with that with a plow pan and without a plow pan. This is showing you black gora. Actually, this shows you black gora can get through a plow pan. The data shows you. I'll go over this rather quickly, but the data shows this is the number of roots below the plow pan for black gora. With a plow pan, without a plow pan, Black Gora doesn't care. IR64, IR64 cannot really get roots through a, through this artificial plow pan. So um, this, this hasn't really been bottomed out, but the, the important message is soil physics matters. And the final thing I want to mention is microbes and sustainability uh, and water, because because now, for the last 10 years, really, we've been moved away from looking at drought and moved into studying alternate wetting and drying. This is a really beautiful technique in which the farmer allows the soil to drain. Instead of having it flooded all the time, they allow, they allow it to drain. And it's, it's kind of good because you, get, you use less water, so it's more sustainable in that sense. It's brilliant because you get less methane production. Methane from rice accounts for 1% of the anthrop anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. This reduces it by more than half, maybe three quarters. Um, it reduces arsenic in the grain, which is something we've been working on for a lot. Um, but the question is, is it sustainable? Because you imagine that it affects soil microbiology. Because the reason farmers flood rice is because it allows a very simple way to control or suppress the biology that goes on in soils, especially weeds. So we've had a look at mycorrhiza. Um, this is a, a study looking at a rice diversity panel. Huge amount of work. Um, we, we actually infected them with uh, Rhizophagus irregularis, the sort of model plant, and we looked at colonization rates we can see this massive and quite reproducible uh, variation in colonization rates between rice cultivars. This is 300 rice cultivars checked. You see this variation. Unfortunately, we don't know the biological consequences of it. So some cultivars seem to have three times the, the colonization rates of others, but we don't understand why. So that's something we've got a BFD student, Mari, who's watching this, I think is working on that right now. 
but we've also very briefly looked at that in, in the context of alternate wetting and drying, because this is an alternate wetting and drying experiment in the green rice project in Italy. So half of these plots have been undergone alternate wetting and drying and half continuously flooding, permanent flooding as it's called here. So this is hypercolonization in permanently flooded rice. This is the same ones under AWD. And what you can see, first of all, is most of these dots are in the this side of the y equals x line so there is more colonization in awd but the patterns are rather complicated the, the, they're not doing the same each cultivar is not doing the same thing so there's a strong genotype by treatment interaction here so we don't really understand the implications of that we'd like to work on that more um, the other thing is root uh, not nematodes uh, a massive problem some parts of the world and, and understudied and what's really important is that it's been found in Italy now it's a tropical pest been found in Italy um, this is the thing it makes these little galls important is this cannot live in aerobic soils it needs oxygen so what we think is it spreads it will spread better in AWD and this is one very simple study where we take two rice cultivar two, two rice plants we infect one, we don't infect the other one. We look at the gauze after five weeks of the infected plant and the non-infected plant. And you can see in aerobic soils, it spreads to the neighbor very well. In continuous flooding, it doesn't spread very well. In AWD, it spreads very well. And I'll go through ever so quickly because my time's up. Uh, we have done screening for nematode resistance we found resistant cultivars. We've tested them in the field and they work in the field. We've mapped it to chromosome 11 using um, QTR-seq. So, and there are people in India and in Italy now using this to breed for nematode resistance. These cultivars. So this is the last, more or less the last slide. Our reflections. Genetics of root growth is very complex and I haven't really mentioned it, but um, yeah huge numbers of genes involved root depth matters sometimes soil physics is important simple methods can be useful for rice the swap to sustainable water use has massive implications on soil biology which i think have yet to be properly addressed what's missing in my research is things like what are the genes we've put in grant proposals but we haven't got the money so Wish I could tell you the genes under there. The response of uh, roots to changing environments is um, uh, it's not something we've ever studied, um, and it's really important. So how do they respond to water, uh, gradients in water, for example? We haven't studied the rhizosphere in any great detail. We haven't really focused on the fine scale roots. We've more concentrated on the, on the main axis. So lots more we could have done. And I wish I had more time to publish everything because an awful lot of stuff we've done hasn't yet been published. And uh, in the next few years, I get around to publishing it. So thanks to a lot of people, a lot of funders. Uh, thank you for listening. Thanks, Adam. That's great. 30 years in just over 15 minutes. So that's that's really good. Um, any questions, Glenn? Uh, yes, we have. Um... Uh, a couple in at the moment. Uh, so, firstly, this is one that I was interested in as well. Um, it's from Malcolm Bennett, and um, Malcolm's asking um, Is the ability of Black Gora to penetrate plough pans um, compared with IR64 due to differences in the root angle or hormone sensitivity, for example, ethylene? I don't know. Uh, I would like to talk to you about that, Ma Malcolm. I, I guess you could uh, you could argue that it is uh, the uh, it could be just simply the ang the diameter of the roots and the angle with which it hits the plow layer is a possibility. But we know I don't know anything about the hormonal sensitivity to ethylene and how that might um, impact. So be interested to know more, Malcolm. Or just direct me to something I should read about that, perhaps. Now, come to, do you want to follow up? 
yeah, yeah. No, it, it would be great to test that out. It's really easy to do. Uh, so, you know, some of you may know the work we've been doing in rice uh, and Arabidopsis, and we've extended it to now tomato or wheat. And it, there seems to be a clear pattern that ethylene insensitivity results in compaction um, resistance, so an ability to penetrate hard soils. So I th I'm just intrigued. You see this really big contrast between IR64 and and black gore. It'd be really interesting to test those two with a simple root bioassay. So let's do it. Uh, yeah. That would be really, really interesting. Great. Excellent. Thanks, Malcolm. With that in mind, yeah. With that in mind, I was just wondering, Adam, do you notice roots? Have we ever actually looked at whether they deflect or stop growing at the plow pad? Uh, we haven't studied that before. Um, Paul, Paul Hallett uh, and myself have a student who's also watching. Uh, Dean is looking at the uh, the Cena and um, Blackora and IR64 going through plow pads, and he may have spotted that, but I don't know. Uh, Dean, can you can you answer that question? Maybe you don't have. I'll get back to you, Dean. Okay. <laughs> oh, Dean. Can you mention the question again? Have you ever uh, see any evidence of the roots being deflected when they hit the plow pan, and a difference between black door and IR sixty four, for example? Yeah, I I, I found uh, I found uh, black gora uh, has the more uh, ab uh, more ability to penetrate the plow pan than the IR64 because of maybe due to the root angle. Uh, uh, black gora has the more stiffer root angle than that of uh, IR64, and you know that. The branching ability uh, of uh, of uh, Blackora is higher than that of uh, IR64. That may be also the another reason for hitting the uh, uh, plow fin uh, more than that of IR64. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. And then I have one final question in from um, from Nico. Uh, and who's asking, uh, have you looked into silicon uptake and silicon deposition in roots and their potential role in improving root penetration? Well, that's a nice, simple question because the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> that's that, a very interesting question. Is that from Nico? Yeah. yeah. No, sorry, Nico. I, I, we've had an interest in silicon, but I guess it's another one of those things where we put grants in and we never got the money to, to, to explore it any further. So. Um, Okay, I think that's all the questions. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, thanks ever so much, Adam, and thanks everyone for that for the contributions to the first session. What we're going to do now is have a look at some of the posters, and my intention is that we will have uh, allow ten or fifteen minutes for a break for uh, for people to have a bit of a rest from the screen once we've had a quick look at the posters. Um, these posters, the link is available to everyone, so you can go, you should be able to go in and have a look at any time at your leisure anyway, but people have done recordings and videos for the posters, so I think it's important that we show them now as well. And anyone who hasn't done a, done a, um, a video or audio for, the, for their poster, if they want to say a few words about their poster when I put it up, then feel free, otherwise we'll move, we'll move past. So I'll share my screen now and, and uh, give you a guide through the poster room that we have. Um, right. So hopefully you can see the poster room. Um, I hope you'll be able to hear when I click on the, the poster. So if we go for Andrew Mayer first, if you can tell me whether you can, oh, but perhaps Andrew is not the best one to go for because he hasn't got a, an audio or a video. Andrew, did you want to say anything about your poster? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, I haven't got anything prepared, but I can. If you, how much time do you want me to? Wait. Just, I mean, just a minute or so. Just, just, or so. just a, a brief summary of what okay. of what you found. Sure. Um, so we've been looking at um, modeling the influence of um, trying to incorporate preferential moisture transport into existing models for moisture flow through soil. Um, 
using the hypothesis that that um, the uh, transport of moisture along plant roots is what increases the saturated hydraulic conductivity of of soil. Um, which is a modeling based approach which involves taking our uh, root architecture data and generating a continuous approximation in the form of a volumetric root density um, and uh, incorporating this into a, a PDE model, which is a modified version of Richard's equation um, using a heterogeneity matrix, which also comes from our root system our architecture data and density. Um, we've then been calibrating uh, the results of this facilitation model, the model we've developed um, against observed results um, or empirical proof for what for water pressure profiles for moisture flow through soils vegetated with willow and grass. And I should say that that comes from the work of uh, Lynn Bengoff and David Baldwin um, and Lung as well. Um, and so we've been comparing them and trying to calibrate our model so that it matches the results. And we've had some um, encouraging results in that respect. We've got that our model is generating pressure curves, which seem to match the empirical profiles um, quite well. Um, so uh, given our root system, we think we can sort of mod develop our model so that it accurately models the preferential transport of moisture through that route, through the preferential pathways caused by that root system. Um, and yeah, if you have any more questions, then please drop me an email or just grab me at some point today. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, put you on the spot there, so thanks for doing that. Um, the so ordinarily we'd send you out with a glass of wine or a cup of coffee or something to have a look at these posters and you'd be asking questions so please feel free to put questions into the chat if you have any for this for the poster presenters and i'm sure they'll pick them up for during the rest of the day and answer them perhaps back in the chat or or via email so i'll move on now to hello today i'm going to be talking about a root anatomical tree can i check can you hear that yes Called the multi-ferrate cortical sclerenchyma or MCS. We did a lot of work characterizing this trait in bays and wheat, and now we have demonstrated its utility for penetration in hard soils. MCS presents itself as small cells with thick cell walls and outer cortical cells. We've observed MCS in bays, wheat, barley, sorghum, and many other cereals. The work I present today is going to be focused on studies on maize and wheat, but presumably the MCS phenotype has similar utility for compaction tolerance in other species. MCS is embedded with lignin. We did FTIR studies showing, as you can see in the heat map, the warm colors like red and pink show where the concentrations are highest, and the cool colors like blue show areas of low concentrations. As you can see, lines with MCS have greater concentrations of lignin in the outer cortex. We then performed experiments using the instron, demonstrating that the MCS phenotype and therefore greater lignin content translates into greater tensile strength of the cortex and greater root tip bending force. We then wanted to test that this greater tensile strength of the root translated into increased penetration of hard soils. We then performed experiments in the field, greenhouse, and growth chamber, and demonstrated that MCS enhanced penetration in hard soils. In the field, greater penetration of compacted soils resulted in greater rooting depth, and deeper rooting in compacted soils translated into greater shoot biomass. So in some cases, MCS have greater lignin content, which translates into greater tensile strength and root tip bending force, resulted in better penetration in hard soils, and therefore greater rooting depth and plant performance. We're continuing the work on this trait in the field, greenhouse, and with some genetic studies. If you have any questions or are interested in learning more, please reach out. So anyone can can email a question to Hannah, I, I guess. Hi, I'm Dr. Bruno Lopez, and today I want to tell you a little bit about the research I have been carrying out with Dr. Roberta Dainese and Professor Alessandro Tarantino. It's about experimental procedures for soil plant continuum monitoring. The response of the VADO zone and of our disruptors is affected by the interaction with the atmosphere. Very frequently, the ground surface is covered by vegetation, and as a result, transpiration plays a major role in ground atmosphere interaction. The soil and the plant form a continuous hydraulic system 
that needs to be characterized to model the boundary condition of the geotechnical water flow problem. Water flow in soil M1 takes place because of gradient in hydraulic heads triggered by the water tension generated in the leaf stomata. To study the response of the soil plant continuum, water tension needs to be monitored not only in the soil, but also in the plant, in addition to the water content in the soil. Our ideal soil plant continuum monitoring system starts with the force characterization of water content spatial distribution using electrical resistivity tomography to support the design of spatial configuration of suction and water content sensors in the soil. Then, the local sensors are installed in the ground to monitor suction and water content distributions. And finally, sensors are also installed on the plant to monitor xylem water pressure. Great. So, uh, so posters have come a long way since I first started doing posters. I can it's much more interactive now than they used to be. Um, so now on to Raisa. Hi, I am Raisa Osama. I'm currently doing my PhD at the James Hutton Institute, and I am working with Phytophthora root drop of raspberry plant. So Phytophthora root drop is a devastating disease of raspberry plant that can cause up to 60% crop loss. This disease is caused by the soil-borne pathogen Phytophthora rubi. The pathogen enters the plant through the root system and gradually spread, spreads upward, ultimately killing the entire plant. The aim of my project is to investigate the effect of the plant hormone auxin on Phytophthora root rot disease development. We screened auxin and auxin-related chemicals on the direct growth of pathogen and observed that TIBA, which is an auxin transport inhibitor, can suppress the growth of Phytophthora on site. We then challenged raspberry plant in soil-free media with Phytophthora and different concentrations of TIBA. The root architecture was analyzed using WindRiser software. It is clear from our results that TIBA is having a negative effect on Phytophthora growth and on the entire infection process. Initially, we also observed that TIBA is promoting root growth when pathogen is present. However, we would like to confirm this observation by doing more reps of the experiment. We are still optimizing the method to quantify disease progression and root architecture. Great. So now we, there's a poster from Peter Hub. Uh, Peter, are you there to say a few words about your poster? If not, then people are welcome to go and read the poster at their leisure. Okay. And we'll move on to the final poster now. Hello, I'm Ranger, a geo-environmental engineer, now back in the industry, having defended my doctoral thesis in the University of Strathclyde. The use of slope reinforcement using roots has been a long-standing interest of mine. However, during my graduate training, a technical director had strong opinions about root systems or brownfield land. Not due to technical or mechanical issues, of which he'd suffered in his early career designing slopes and cyclone prone Papua New Guinea, but more so in the risk of disturbing contaminated ground. Indeed, once proclaimed, no developer wants to have the newly built estate full of dead trees. This has stuck with me and is an issue that seems to be a lingering concern for due environmental consultancies when I've discussed this matter with them at conferences. This research undertakes an initial logic that determined whether the two foremost issues raised might present an issue. In the case of phytotoxicity from contaminated ground preventing trees grow, cover systems over brownfield sites are only around 600 millimetres thick, and therefore well within the root zone of trees, it seems unlikely that pollution uptake would grow phytotoxic in all but the most contaminated sites. Indeed, some researchers have gone so far as to plant willow saplings in gasworks slurries to no ill effect. 
However, uptake through the root system to the plant's leaves and fruit seems to be of concern. The concentrations of arsenic of only 200 milligrams per kilogram might lead to leaf litters containing more than 32 milligrams of arsenic coinciding with the soil guideline value, which was partially set due to plant uptake posing a risk for not only humans, but also important organisms in the soil environment. The possibility of plants reintroducing pollution to the environment is concerning enough on slopes and banking alongside major highways and railways. However, in remediated brownfield sites, this becomes more insidious with the opportunity for residents to regularly consume contaminated fruits and small children's geophagia on potentially severely contaminated ground. Thank you for your time. Great. So that's the, the range of posters we have. Uh, as you can see, there's a broad range of different, uh, different subjects. And as I said, the link is available for all to go and have a look at um, whenever you like and, and study in more detail. I'd like to say thanks to all the poster presenters for for taking the time to put these together. They're very very creative, and also I'd like, like to say thanks to Malcolm Colley, who's our IT colleague here at the Hutton, who put this poster room together. And I think it's a really effective way of demonstrating the posters in a virtual environment. So thanks, Malcolm. So I'll stop sharing now, and we have 15 minutes or so before the uh, before the next session starts. So I think it's an opportunity to have a comfort break and. A cup, cup of coffee maybe and uh, I'll, I'll start the session again the next session again at three o'clock so come back by then please
plant current access the most abundant source of nutrients in soil, which is held as soil organic matter. And if you look at the microbial community, it's almost a mirror image. Microbial communities, or at least some populations within communities, have the capacity um, to mineralize soil organic matter and access nutrients. But most commonly, their activity in soils is limited by the availability of energy rich uh, carbon substrates, something the plant has in abundance. So I would argue that it would be very strange if plants and free living microbes have co evolved in land for more than 450 million years if they hadn't developed mutually beneficial strategies which helped to overcome those mirrored restrictions, if you like, on their productivity. So just to, to zoom in a little bit more and sort of introduce the, the methods of that, on the left hand panel here, we have mineralization of soil organic matter without an influence of a plant. And this is how influences on soil organic matter mineralization have been studied for a whole host of years. And you can you can narrow it down to abiotic factors, it's temperature and moisture that tend to drive this arrow here. Um, and indeed, this kind of representation is what's most commonly still used in, in soil carbon models. If you introduce a plant into the system and the interactions between the roots and the microbes, it's a whole host of, of different, more complex interactions that are going on in this system, affecting the turnover of the, the soil organic matter. The reason that I have coloured these as green and red is to show, well, first of all, in this case, it's easy to measure the effect of temperature or moisture on turnover of organic matter because you just measure the respiration. But in this system, you've got respiration coming from plant derived sources and also from soil organic matter derived sources. So the way that we do this is we give the, the plant or the root exudates a specific isotopic signal, carbon 13 signal, distinct from the soil organic matter, so that when we collect respiration, we can partition that into what's been derived from the plant and what's been derived from soil organic matter. And the really nice thing about this is you can basically look at the effect of the plant on this process here. So how do we do it? We've got very simple systems. Um, here using a, a rhizon sampler as an artificial route to deliver labelled exudate compounds into soil. It's good because it's a very precise way of doing it. It's a nice way to look at mechanisms, but clearly it, it doesn't encompass the full range of plant soil interactions that will affect, for example, soil organic matter turnover. So to do this, we've got a continuous 13C labeling setup, um, which allows us to give the plant a very distinct signal, still be able to partition respiration sources, the plant and soil organic matter. And we can apply this over the full cycle of a, an annual plant. So in terms of data, this, these are what I would consider to be fairly typical priming responses. What we have are four soils, and we've added increasing amounts of glucose to those soils, and then measured the effect that that glucose has on the evolution of mineralized soil organic matter. So as we increase the, the glucose addition rate, we tend to increase the soil organic matter mineralization rate as well, but it tends to plateau off. Now this is consistent with glucose driving the activity of a component of the soil biota to mineralize that soil organic matter. And the other thing you'll see clearly from the graph is that the magnitude of those priming responses can be very different between different soils. And I'm not gonna say more about that now, but we could come back to that in discussion. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the soil organic matter contains nutrients as well as carbon. Um, so what we wanted to do in this experiment was work out how much nitrogen was supplied per unit of carbon from soil organic matter that was mineralized. So we combined our 13C labeling approach with a 15N pool dilution uh, assay, which allows measurement of gross nitrogen fluxes. So if we look at this figure here on the left, the blue bar here is the, the C to N ratio of the soil organic matter flux when there's no plant in the system. But when we put a plant in the system, the C to N ratio narrows very rapidly and it's implying 
that the C10 ratio of this additional flux is actually very low. It's about four to one in the experiment you did in this case, which is suggesting that the microbial communities are specifically targeting nitrogen rich moieties within the soil organic matter, for example, through the production of protease to liberate nitrogen. So, again, emphasizing the importance of the process in terms of productivity as well as carbon balance of the system. So, if a lack of nitrogen availability can be a driver of primary effects, does it also follow that if there is an abundance of nitrogen, then the, the mineralization of soil organic matter is reduced? So, we had a system here. The top part is an unfertilized system. Uh, showing the, the mineralization of soil organic matter in the y axis. Whereas in the bottom part of the panel, we have a, a system where the nutrient addition was continuous through the experiment. And what we find is not only did the nutrient addition reduce soil organic matter mineralization, it reduced it more relative to the, to the unplanted soil. So we've actually got a negative primary effect here. So somewhere along this pathway, there's an inhibition. And I've shown these vials here to suggest that perhaps it's accumulating to some extent in dissolved organic matter. So the planted vials here are much darker in colour, indicating a higher concentration of DOC. So I want for the, the final part of the talk just to, to talk about using a plant to manage soil functions. And I guess a, a prerequisite of that is that a, a genotype or a cultivar. Of a, of a crop species or grass species is, is going to affect the community structure of rhizosphere populations. So this is, is work that Rodrigo did during his PhD uh, with Davida and others, using ecotypes um, from different regions, putting them in a common soil and determining what the microbial community structure was. And we could see clearly that there was partitioning of communities depending on the, the genotype of the the host plant. I'm not going to say much about the, the detail here because I think Carmen may come to this in the, the next presentation, but I wanted to introduce Nambani's PhD, and this is the, the plant uh, material that he used. He used recombinant chromosome substitution lines, which result in small introgressions of wild type genotype within a, a, a modern elite uh, background. So when Nambani used um, these genotypes. First of all, he was able to show that there was really quite significant variation in the extent to which these genotypes stimulated soil organic matter mineralization, and that looking at community physiological profiles of those communities, the clustering of the communities on the physiological profile basis was similar to how they separated out in terms of the magnitude effect on soil organic matter mineralization. We are able to take this through to very broad characterization of where those uh, hotspots on the genome may be for those interaction traits. I get extremely excited when I saw this first, and Joanne Russell and others then explained it's more than 100 genes in these regions. But still, it was it was nice to see. So just to fin finish up, um, we used that as a as a proof of concept. Um, to apply these approaches within maize germplasm in sub-Saharan Africa. We were very lucky to get involved in collaboration with CIMIT, who had access to maize germplasm, and also a wide range of uh, trials in countries in the region. We were interested in trying to develop screening approaches so that we can introduce those traits into cultivars. And one of the, the things that's encouraging to us is that the the mineralization assay for carbon corresponds very well with what you then measure as mineralization of nitrogen in the system. And using the carbon labeling as a screen is much easier because you're ending, you're measuring an end product of CO2 rather than having to destructively sample the soil. And one of the interesting things that's coming out of the data now is that we seem to have a strong interaction not just between genotype and soil function also between genotype and management and function. So here we've got a system where we had conventional tillage or no tillage, and the performance of the, the cultivars is 
quite strongly dependent on the management type on those, those systems. So two very, very broad conclusions. Rhizosphere microbiome selection and impact on soil processes, plantations, typically specific. And there does seem to be strong potential for plant breeding to optimize root microbe interactions for sustainable soil function. And I'll leave it there with the, the many people I have to ha have to help for this one. Thank you. This one. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. That's great. So if you don't like soil physics, then there's some soil chemistry and microbiology for you as well. So um, any questions, Glenn? If not, I, I'll I'll kick something off. But I'm I'm just frank, frankly shocked at your be remarks about soil physics there. But, I, know, I, know, uh, I know, I know, I was re I was wondering, um, Eric, uh, just one point regarding how easy is it to think or possible to pick a genotype that will perform the functions that you need in a whole range of different environments. Do you think the genotype is very much the dominant thing here, or? I, I think, to be honest, Glenn, we, we don't know. I mean, I, and it's a really, it's a key question. I mean, if we're going to develop germplasm to be used widely, it, it needs to be applicable across a, a range of environments, soil types mm -hmm. and conditions. Um, I think my hunch is that it's, it's probably between the the two extremes. Um, so I, I don't think there's one single genotype that, that would be a perfect performer across all ecosystems and systems. But I guess if you get your genotype and your soil management going the right direction, then it's going to help. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. So my, my question, it would be um, it, to to mitigate against climate change. I mean, the, one of the drives is to is to increase carbon sequestration into soils. Another would be to reduce nutrient inputs, particularly nitrogen. So you get this situation where you have you wanting to promote carbon sequestration, but also promote the release of nitrogen from soils as well to yeah. replace the fertilizer. Is it possible to do both at the same time? And and if so, can can genotypes kind of prime that? Yeah, I I like Henry Johnson's view of soil organic matter. Um, his view is that there isn't a huge point in continually building it up <coughs> in itself, because by doing that, you're you're not taking advantage of what one of its main beneficial properties is, and that's when it's being consumed, because that's what releases the nutrients instead of having to apply a, a fertilizer. So I, I think maybe one relevant thing, the work we're doing in Africa, it's very much linked to the management practice. So in this case, conservation agriculture, which involves retaining the residues on the, the soil surface. So you're, you're putting back carbon by doing that, but what you're wanting to do is actually promote its turnover to maximize the nutrient supply. So to be able to do that, you need to foster interactions with microbial communities that are good at doing that decomposition process. And because that process is gradual, you don't have huge pulses of nutrient in the system. The ideal being that the nutrient release matches the plant demand. Thanks. Well, we've got time for a couple. Yeah, we've got time for a couple more questions. More if you want, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's one from Peter, Peter Gregory, um, saying, Eric, your RPE results in 2013 showed the importance of soil type. What properties are, are likely to be the main drivers? Okay, the, the reason I left that hanging is uh, Paul Hallett and I have a student, Luke Carroll, who's, who's working on interactions with mineralogy, um, specific impacts of exudates, not necessarily in microbial communities, but on collation of metals, of, of those kind of physical chemical processes that are intrinsic to how root soil interactions are working. So I, I, I think it comes down to soil properties is certainly one of the things that has a big influence across soil types. 
There's also a question from Imelda uh, asking what could explain the difference in the rhizosphere priming effect in the topsoil and subsoil, which is a little bit related to that. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. again, it would be difficult to give a single answer. It, it could be a structural thing. Um, it could be a quality of carbon thing down the, down the, the soil profile, or it could even be the abundance of the, the microbes that are able to mediate that process. So if you've got a lower population of a, a certain degrading organism, just because of where it is in the soil profile, that is likely then to affect the process as well. Because it's not every member of the microbial community that is able to do those processes. And a, a final question now from Ezekiel, who asks, how did you separate the root respired carbon from microbial? Okay, that, that, that's, a, that's a really good question, actually, because there's, there's two components of the microbial respiration. So there's microbial respiration, which is from soil organic matter, and there's microbial respiration, which is from root exited space. But we don't separate the we're not trying to work out how much of the, the plant derived carbon is from mineralization of exudates as opposed directly from, from root exudation or root respiration. So. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, so we'll now move on to the next talk, which is we're moving even more into microbiology now. So uh, Carmen Escudero Martinez from the University of Dundee will be. Uh, giving us a talk now on mapping barley genes shaping the rhizosphere bacterial microbiota. So, Carmen, if you share your slides and you can, the floor is yours. I hope you can see my slides and see. It's, we can see your screen yeah, if you in presenter mode, then yeah. yes, perfect. Now, let me so. pointer. Yes, so thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity of presenting this project, Mapping Barley Genes, Shaping the Rhizosphere Microbiota. As Tim said, is really focused on the uh, 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 microbes in the soil. And uh, microbes are, are essential for food security. If we get to understand how the, these microbes, they can enhance the crop fitness, we can use them instead chemical inputs to uh, uh, contribute to a more sustainable agriculture. And in this project, we are focused on uh, the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is the thin layer of soil that is surrounding the, the roots. And this uh, particular area that uh, we were listening before is uh, highly influenced by the plant inhabited in this space. And is so uh, uh, this environment is so exceptional that only certain microbes they can thrive uh, under these conditions. And why we are interested in these microbes is because they have been shown that they can provide access to soluble nutrients and protect plants against uh, uh, abiotics and bio biotic stresses, and it get, they can even enhance the plant development and growth. But how the plant are, are, are acquiring all these microbial services, uh, we think that root exudates, root architecture, and the plant immune system, they can be uh, impacting in the recruitment of the microbiota. And what these three things they have in common is that they have a genetic origin, a genetic host origin. And this is what we are going to uh, project. So uh, in the lab, we are interested to study genetic diversity and link it to microbial diversity. And for that, we think that a good strategy is going back to wild relatives of crops and uh, 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 try to, uh, to see what is uh, the microbial diversity there. Because we know that through domestication and killing for crop kill, this, uh, uh, the host genetic diversity uh, has been narrowing down, but we don't know what had happened with the uh, interaction with microbes. We don't know if, if through this breeding process, if we have been selected the best microbial traits, or we have left behind some interesting traits. So our vision is to breed for the plant microbial interactions and uh, hopefully make, make plants more resilient, contributing in this uh, more sustainable agroecosystems. So in this project, uh, I'm using or we are using barley as a model to study crop microbiota interaction uh, interactions. 
uh, barley is uh, widely cultivated. We have a lot of genetic resources such as accessions, mutants, and wild relatives that are very in uh, important for this project since we can uh, cross them with uh, varieties. We have a diploid genome and we have uh, available recently the pan genome, pan genome so 20 geno genotypes uh, genome available. We can apply gene editing to study gene function and speed breeding to shorten the, the life uh, uh, cycle generations. So how we have been studying the microbiota, we used normally an agricultural soil that we uh, put in pots and where we plant our barley, different genotypes. And then we are going to extract uh, DNA from the rhizosphere and bulk soil as a control. And uh, from this, we are going to create libraries and we can create libraries, libraries with the 16S ribosomal RNA uh, ribosom uh, taxonomic marker for bacteria and archaea or the ITS uh, if we are interested in uh, the fungal community. So then we sequence uh, that libraries and we can uh, see what is the composition or what is the function if we use shotgun metagenomics. But in this case, it's a targeted approach. So we are going to use the 16, I'm going to talk about libraries, 16, 16S libraries, so archaea or bacteria and their composition. And then we also spend a significant time uh, analyzing this data. I have to say that throughout my slides, I will have uh, relevant information here at the bottom of the slide that is interesting for the future. So uh, previously in the lab, we observed that the rhizosphere microbiota diversified between the uh, wild and elite barley. And this is what is shown here in this constrained principal coordinate analysis. So we can see here that the rhizosphere uh, uh, that well, in this kind of, of plot, I, 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 I explained that every point is representing one microbial profile, even in the rhizosphere or the root, and as, as closer are the dots, more related are these, uh, more similar are these uh, uh, profiles. So uh, we have uh, uh, here clustering all together the microbial uh, profiles in the root or the rhizosphere or of an elite variety which are very different of a wild variety. And under the same abiotic conditions, uh, this is, uh, has a genetic origin, and this is what we are trying to see in this project. So for doing that, the uh, strategy is to uh, use an exercise of mapping. If we can map, the, and the, the question is, the hypothesis is, if we can map barley genes associated with rhizosphere bacteria, and for that, we are going to use a segregating population that ideally will consist in a elite parent here represented in blue and a wild parent represented in orange. And we are going to uh, have this segregating population that will consist mostly in an elite parent genome with the introgressions of the wild parent. And with that, we are going to assess the bacterial compositions as I said with the, uh, the 16S taxonomic mark. So, uh, yes, uh, in Barley, we have a lot of genetic resources, and uh, one of these is this multiparent nested, nested association mapping population generated by Klaus Pilen in uh, Halle, Germany. So, this population is consisted in 25 wild barley genotypes crossed with Barke, and then uh, we have a back cross uh, with Barke again. So, we will have this most uh, 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 elite a barque-like genome with introgression of, uh, of the wild barleys. And every cross, each of the wild barley cross with barque represent one family. In this case, I'm going to talk about family 15, and we are going to assess the microbial composition abundances as phenotyping mapping to identify genetic regions responsible for the plant host microbiota recruitment. So first of all, we needed to test if this population is suitable and for any exercise of mapping, we need to have a contrasting uh, phenotype, in this case, a microbial phenotype between the parental lines. And this is what is shown here in this ternary plot. Uh, so every point here is representing a bacterial genus in this case. And uh, the, the size of the, of the point is proportional to the abundance of that bacteria. And then we have different microhabitats, some planted soil, wild or elite, and as closer are the dot to these microhabitats, more related are to them. 
So highlighted in orange is taxa significantly enriched in the wild barley, which is different from uh, the taxa highlighted in blue, which is enriched in the elite uh, variety. So the answer is yes, we have a contrasting bacterial uh, phenotype or microbial phenotype between two, the two parental lines. So with this, we can uh, uh, proceed with the mapping. And here in this canonical analysis of principal coordinates, I'm showing the, the rhizosphere profiles, uh, microbial profiles of these lines. So here we have the control, the bulk soil, which is very different of what is a, a rhizosphere sample. And um, then uh, we have the uh, rhizosphere profiles corresponding to the wild parent clustering all together, and they are very different of uh, elite variety, similarly of, of what I shown before. Then we have here highlighted in, represented in pink, the segregating population, which if you see is orbiting around the leaf parent. And uh, th so these microbial uh, rhizosphere profiles, they are uh, mimicking somehow the uh, uh, genetic composition of the segregating population. Because if you remember, the segregating population was a back cross with the leaf parent. So this was very interesting. And uh, moreover, this segregant population display a quantitative phenotype, which we can use in mapping. So yes, we use this uh, different bacterial abundances as a quantitative trait uh, for scanning all the uh, barley uh, chromosomes for significant associations uh, uh, with the different taxa. And here we have this genus as an example, uh, which is called Bariogorax, and we can see a, a very a significant association uh, with a region in the 3H uh, uh, chromosome of barley. If we repeat the same exercise with all uh, the taxa that were differentially enriched between the parental lines, we can build a genetic mapping, which is this that I'm showing here. Uh, represented in orange is the bacterial enriched in the wild parent, and in blue, the bacterial mapping that was enriched in the uh, elic parent. And we can see that limited velocity, they support the microbial recruitment, but uh, uh, we were surprised to see that this, re uh, this locus in the chromosome 3H is associated with up to six unrelated taxonomically bacteria. And uh, this represents 5% of the microbial reads mapping on this pH locus. And um, so we, we were interested in to prioritize uh, this locus for further uh, study. So the next step it will be to, uh, to produce uh, a validation of all these mapping exercises with an independent library. So the strategy that we follow, it was to uh, take introgression lines, what we call introgression lines. So these lines, they have wide introgressions at the locus of interest. And I have to say that these are not near isogenic lines. So we will have another wide introgressions in other regions of the uh, genome, and um, uh, including this uh, 3H uh, locus. So we genotype these lines. And we select this line 19 and line 56, which are, uh, uh, by genotyping with the 50K chip, are 10% different from uh, the lead variety bucket. And uh, I have to say that these two lines are genetically identical. So once we have the uh, genetic profile of these lines, we wanted to see if they can uh, produce a shift in the microbiota. So this is what I'm showing here in this canonical analysis of principal coordinate. We can see here represented in blue uh, how all the, the rhizosphere profiles of the lead variety they cluster together and they are significantly different from uh, the rhizosphere profiles of the introgression lines. So uh, we, we know now that these lines they have a microbial profile and uh, this, uh, all this is at community level, and we wanted to see which taxa is responsible for that differentiation. So for that, we need to do another type of analysis, and it's this pairwise comparison, and for instance, uh, line introduction line 19, compared with the lead variety, we have a set of taxa genus that are enriched in these introduction lines with the wild introductions at the 3 edge locus, and then also, we found uh, some genus that are enriched in the elite variety. So I, this confirmed us that these lines, they have a microbial uh, a phenotype. 
And uh, I have to say as well that this taxa is not exactly the same taxa that we retrieve from mapping, but uh, we can, uh, uh, but this file genetically related, we can make that link. So for, for us, this is a confirmation of the, uh, and a validation of our mapping. So then uh, uh, my colleague, Max, Max Coulter, uh, he uh, was using root RNA-seq to identify barley genes shaping the microbiota. And for that, we used these two introgression lines, 19 and 15, that if you remember that, genetically identical. And then uh, the elite barque, and we sampled the six uh, uppermost part of the roots uh, for RNA-seq. Uh, because it's the same part that we sample, we survey for microbes, and then uh, we uh, study the transcriptional profiles of these lines. So if we do this uh, pairwise comparison between the integration line 19 compared with Barke and integration line 15 with Barke, we have a fairly good amount of differential expressions. However, when we compare the two integration lines, this uh, differential expression is marginal. Let's see this in a different way, in a different way of plotting this. Uh, what we can see here is when we compare the two integration lines with uh, uh, Barke, with the elite variety, we can see that uh, the, transcription, uh, the, the transcriptional response is, is very much overlapping between the two integration lines. And it's uh, what I'm showing here highlighted in green. So let's see this data or plotted in, in, in this scatter plot. So we can see uh, on the x-axis the log two fold change of the integration line 19 versus the lead barque, and in the y-axis the log fold change integration line 15 versus barque. And uh, highlighted in green uh, so are the genes that are commonly differentially expressed between the integration lines compared with the uh, elite variety barque. So what we can see is that this scatter plot is almost a diagonal, and this uh, tells us that the two integration lines they have a congruent transcriptional profile uh, uh, compared with Barke. And then, moreover, uh, if we see uh, this green dot uh, uh, in the genes upregulated in the integration lines compared with Barke, we this corresponds to the higher log fold chains, and the same. When we compare, uh, uh, when we see the, the genes that are downregulated in this, uh, uh, in both uh, integration lines compared with Barke, we see that also they correspond to the higher uh, log fold chains. So this was very interesting. And the next, the next question uh, it will be if some of these uh, um, uh, uh, genes uh, depicted here in green that are uh, congruently uh, 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 expressed. Uh, compared with the uh, elite variety, they, they are uh, mapping at the 3 edge locus. And the answer is yes. So we have this set of genes, up to five genes, that are mapping at this 3 edge locus that was retrieved by the uh, mapping exercise. So this will be good candidates, especially because uh, we can link this to processes putatively implicated uh, microbiota recruitment, such as root exudates, root cell architecture, or this NLR involved in the uh, immune system. And with that, uh, as a conclusion, I, I have told you that microbiota composition is a quantitatively and genetically tractable trait in barley. We have located and validated a major regulator of this trait on the chromosome 3H, and we have identified candidate uh, for this trait putatively implicated in processes as diverse as immune recognition, cell wall remodeling, and exudation. But all they can be linked to uh, microbial recruitment. And with that, I would like to, uh, to thank all the people involved in this project and all the, the collaborators. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very happy to take questions. Thanks, Colin. That was, that was great. Uh, Glenn, any questions? If not, I have one to kick off. Okay, do you want to kick off, Tim? Okay, so, so obviously, um, there's, there's big changes in the microbial, uh, the microbiota in the rhizosphere with plant genotype and so on. But um, there's also lots of functional redundancy in the rhizosphere microbi my, uh, microbiota, and I wonder, understanding the the sort of microbial community structure, how important is that really for understanding function? Yes, uh, that is something that uh, we are going to test as well. 
this is uh, yeah is is definitely is very important because what we are looking for at functions at the end and, and what is the 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 benefit or not that these microbes they can have uh, they can be linked to that genes so uh, we are first looking uh, um, other plant phenotypes such as root exudates gel and something that this uh, 3h locus could provide and and we we think that this is coming because of the microbes so this could be uh, uh, also telling us what function these microbes they have uh, but also we are planning to do a syncom assay, so we are we have a collection now of um, uh, barley derived uh, 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 taxa, and we are going to uh, to set this uh, known uh, composition of of, uh, of a syncom, a, a community, a synthetic community of taxa, and uh, we can see if this is providing a plant uh, phenotype or um, taxa that is obviously linked to the mapping. And we can see if this is providing some uh, improvement or or not or uh, or <laughs> or the, um, a disadvantage to the to the plant performance. Great, thanks. Do we have any questions from the floor? Okay, I don't think we have any further. So, okay, so thanks, Carmen. Um, if Thank you'd you. like to stop sharing now, we'll move on to the next talk. And thanks for that. It's uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, let me stop sharing. Great. So, thank you. So now we go back to physics uh, from biology, from microbiology. So um, we have David Baldron, who's also at University of Dundee, and he's going to give us a talk on hydromechanical reinforcement of soil by plants. Plant traits matter. So over to David. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so thank you. Good afternoon. I am David Boldrin from the University of Dundee and the James Sutton Institute. And today I'm going to present a part of my research on soil bioengineering. And in particular, I will focus on hydrological reinforcement provided by plants on slopes. So we already know that slope failures and uh, landslide are predicted to increase as a consequence of uh, climate change and also that human activities such as deforestation um, are increasing the tendency of slopes in the presence of triggers such as uh, heavy rain events. So in this context, soil bioengineering can represent a cost effective and environmentally, environmentally friendly solution for the stabilization of slopes in alternative to traditional engineering techniques which have high embodied energy and carbon. So, but how plants can stabilize soil on slopes? Plants can stabilize the soil on slopes with two co-occurring mechanisms. The first one is the root mechanical reinforcement, which is provided by roots that can cross a potential failure plane on a slope, and also roots that create a composite material with a soil, composite material with enhanced mechanical properties. The second mechanism is the hydrological reinforcement, which is provided by plant transpiration, which decreases the soil water content, and this translates in an increase of uh, soil matrix action, which bind together the particle of soils and hence increase the soil strength. So if we look to the soil bioengineering literature, we can see that we had fewer study on uh, hydrological reinforcement compared to the root mechanical one. And in particular, while in the case of uh, root mechanical reinforcement, we have several correlation between uh, this uh, uh, form of reinforcement and plant traits, in particular biomechanical traits of roots. In the case of hydrological reinforcement, plant traits were totally ignored in uh, the literature. And in general, we can say that in the literature, there were no information about the effects of plant traits, different species, and also different plant functional types. 
and so there was a strong need to combine plant ecophysiology and engineering to better understand uh, hydrological reinforcement. Another problem with the studies in, um, in literature is the scale of the study. In fact, on one end, we have a small laboratory studies and on the other end we have the monitoring of mature vegetation systems such as forest and so we often miss the one of the scale of interest of soil bioengineering which is, a, is for example the scale of main made slopes such as embankments but also its temporal scale in fact in soil bioengineering we are particularly interested to the time effectiveness of these solutions, something that we cannot see in the case of small laboratory experiments and also in the monitoring of uh, uh, mature vegetation systems. So given the no novelty of the study, we decided to progressively move from a control environment uh, in a glass, um, using glass house experiments to the validation of these results in a full scale field experiment on a real embankment prone to failure. And now I am going to describe these different experiments. So initially we start in a glass house control environment where we grow 10 woody species um, in pots. And here you can see a strong and significant correlation between soil matrix action and penetration resistance, so soil strength. And uh, this correlation highlights the effectiveness of hydrological reinforcement induced by different species with different transpiration rates. And this uh, value were recorded after one week from soil saturation, so after one week of evapotranspiration. And here the red triangle represents the value recorded in fallow control soil, so soil without plants. So at this point, we have a question. Can we use plant traits to explain the differences between these 10 woody species? So to answer to this question, we selected 11 plant traits and we measure these plant traits for each of the 10 uh, woody species that we grow in the glass house. And we have both above ground and below ground traits. For example, among the above ground traits, you can see the specific leaf area. Among the below ground traits, you can see the specific root length. Then we use the principal component analysis to group these uh, different traits and also the hydrological reinforcement induced to the soil. And um, here you can see three main groups of traits. We have a first group highlighted in red, which enclose all the plant traits associated with hydrological reinforcement of soil, indicated by matrix action and penetration resistance. And these traits are root length density, root shoot ratio, and specifically theory. Then we have a second group highlighted in green, which group all the plant traits uh, related with plant sites, such as, for example, total, total biomass. And a last group highlighted in blue with all plant traits that we can uh, associate with plant hydraulic architecture, such as the leaf conductors to water vapor, or the wood density. So here you can see two strong correlations uh, between two plant traits, uh, root shoot ratio and specifically theory with hydrological reinforcement, again indicated by soil matrix action and the soil penetration resistance. As you can see, there, the penet um, there is a clear correlation between this traits and the induced hydrological reinforcement in the soil and also it's interesting to highlight that we have above uh, below ground and above ground traits affecting the uh, hydrological reinforcement. As I mentioned there was no a clear relation between uh, plant biomass and the induced hydrological reinforcement and so we wanted to explain this and we look to both daily transpiration of our 10 different woody species and also the transpiration efficiency of these species. And we calculate the transpiration efficiency in this case as daily transpiration per shoot biomass. And as you can see here, we have uh, species with uh, um, a small transpiration efficiency, so small transpiration per shoot biomass. In this case, you can see Citizus coparius, 
this species, and a species with high transpiration per shoot biomass, such as Prunus spinosa, this species here. So these differences in terms of transpiration efficiency can explain the lack of correlation between the size of a plant, the biomass of a plant, and the induced hydrological reinforcement in the soil. And transpiration efficiency in our study was mainly explained by the leaf conductance to water vapor. And here you can see a clear correlation and again the two contrasting uh, species that I previously mentioned. So some re final remarks from this initial part of the study is that woody species largely differ in their ability to induce hydrological reinforcement. We identify plant traits associated with hydrologic reinforcement, and so there is the potential to screen plant species for the induced hydrologic reinforcement on the base of plant traits. However, at this point of the study, we still don't know the effect of soil depth, season, and plant phenology. So we want to answer to this question. And to answer to this question, we select three contrasting species from the previous study, Adesidus, Corius avellanea, and two evergreens, Ilex aquifolium and Ulex europaeus, and we grow these plants again in a glasshouse control environment, but in this case in a one meter long soil columns. And we monitor the induced uh, matrix action down the soil profile during both summer and winter, again after the full saturation of soil. And here you can see during the summer that in the shallow soil, all the three tested species were able to induce high value of matrix suction. But if we look deeper in the soil at 0.3 meters, only two of the species were able to induce high value of matrix suction. And deeper again, only one of the uh, three tested species was able to induce high value of matrix suction. Then if we look during the um, winter period, you can see that uh, as expected, only evergreens were able to induce high value of matrix suction, but at a much slower rate compared to the summer period. And if we look deeper in the soil, only one of the species was able to induce high value of um, matrix suction. And deeper again in the soil at 0.7 meters, we can see just small values of matrix suction. So we want also to look to the residual suction after uh, heavy rain events. And so we simulate two heavy rain events, one at the end of the summer monitoring period and one at the end of the winter monitoring period. And as you can see here, the um, heavy rain events, the simulation of heavy rain events, destroy the matrix suction in the shallow soil layers, but we are able to maintain uh, some residual suction in the deeper soil layer. So in this case, the deeper soil layer is not affected by the heavy rain events. The different than the um, abilities of species to induce matrix suction during, a uh, during seasons and down the soil profile translate in different degrees of soil strength again uh, during uh, uh, seasons, so summer and winter, and also down the soil profile. For instance, you can see that in the case of Ulex europaeus, this was able to induce a soil strength again down the entire soil profile during both uh, the summer period, so the closed symbols here, and also during the winter period, the open symbols down the entire soil profile. While in contrast, uh, the Decidus Corellus avellana was able to induce a, st a soil strength again just during the summer period. So some remarks for this second part of the study is that tested species differ in their ability to induce hydrological reinforcement down the soil profile. And uh, during winter, evergreens were able to induce hydrological, hydrological reinforcement, but at a much slower rate compared to the summer period. And also there are larger differences between evergreens due to their different growth rate and also use of resources. So the results that I presented at the, to this point were obtained in a glasshouse control environment 
and solver was valid to validate these results in a field experiment upon uncontrolled climate and soil variability. So we vegetated an embankment, an embankment prone to failure, with uh, three contrasting uh, species that we previously tested in the, um, in the glasshouse control environment. And here you can see the change of matrix action along the embankment, uh, so in this direction. And in particular, you can see a clear matrix action pattern in relation to uh, the, um, the different species. And in particular, we have peaks of matrix action in the plots vegetated with Ulex europeus. And interesting, there was a consistency between uh, matrix action pattern and uh, soil shear strength pattern. And again, we have peaks of both matrix action and shear strength in the plots vegetated with Ulex europeus. So there is a clear effect of hydrological reinforcement and also a clear species effect in this case. This during the summer, but if we look during the winter, again, along our embankment and we test both matrix action and soil shear strength, we can see that matrix action mainly disappear it's much smaller, and also the soil shear strength show smaller value. So the soil is much weaker, and this highlights a clear seasonal effect. So we have a species effect, difference between the different plots along the embankment, but also a clear seasonal effect between the summer and the autumn period. So in conclusion for this study, we can say that hydrological reinforcement was probably the main mechanism of soil reinforcement during the early stage establishment of plants, probably more important than the root mechanical reinforcement at that stage. The most of experiments were run after uh, three, four months from, uh, from planting. So after three, four months of plant establishment and the full scale experiment. So the experiment in the field on a, a controlled climate and the soil condition highlighted a similar species ranking with the glasshouse experiment in terms of hydrological reinforcement. And so there is a clear scope to select the species to provide hydrological reinforcement. Um, in addition to the selection of species for root mechanical reinforcement on the base, for example, on, of root architectural traits and uh, root biomechanical properties. So we can use these new traits to identify species that are functional to provide hydrological reinforcement. So thank you for your attention. And if you want to know more about this study, of course, you can uh, you can ask, or uh, here there are some publications uh, from the results of this study. Thank you. Thanks, David. That's great. Um, Glenn, any questions? There's a question from um, Alessandro, and he's just wondering about the measurement of stomatal conductance. How you measured it? Is it measured under energy limited conditions with a stomatal open? Yeah, so the stomata conductance, uh, we measure that, we measure in the first glasshouse experiment, uh, and we found no correlation with induced hydrological reinforcement, that because of course there are several uh, uh, factors, several traits that affect that, and we measure that uh, two days after soil saturation, so when soil was close to field capacity, that was the condition, and we measure using a leaf porometer. Um, following that, um, Alessandro was just making a comment to say, to what extent does the suction disappear in heavy winter rainfall? Uh, is that just when you need it, if you see what I mean, from a landslide risk, risk prevention? And how much is that a factor? What's the balance of hydrological reinforcement throughout the year? 
Yes, yes. That, that is a really good point. So we can say that to better understand that we needed to include another variable, the soil depth. So the, the point is that, yes, in the shallow soil, especially if uh, uh, we have a quite a loose soil, we probably will, this, uh, all this action will disappear with uh, also uh, small rain events. But in the deeper soil layers from our glass house experiment, we were able to maintain that suction in the deeper soil layer. However, there are several variables that can affect that. And the first one is the soil hydraulic conductivity. In the, our glass house experiment, we were testing a, a recompacted soil, a sieved soil. We sieved the soil at 10 millimeters and we packed that soil. So that soil, are, I will say, a relatively low hydraulic conductivity. While, for example, in the experiment in the field on the embankment, we test the matrix suction in, uh, at uh, 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 meters in the soil, so relatively shallow uh, soil layers and matrix suction disappear during autumn after also small rain events, but in this case we have a quite a loose soil, we have a soil uh, with a lot of gravel uh, and uh, not a recompacted soil, so we have much higher hydraulic conductivity. So, important factors, soil depth and the hydraulic conductivity of soil to better understand that. Yeah. So, David. Maybe, maybe time for one more quick question. Okay, uh, we have a uh, one from Paul, which asks about evidence of the extent of drying by roots. Would it have any residual impact on soil strength after rewetting? Okay, so I will uh, I will say yes because we measure soil strength. Uh, uh, also, at um, I I will show in a this study, but we also measure the soil strength uh, at the saturation. Uh, so after a very saturation of the soil, and generally uh, we found that the soil strength in the vegetated soil was two times stronger. Uh, also after the soil saturation. Uh, of course, somebody can say, but that was just the result of root mechanical reinforcement. But I will say that we measure that by uh, penetration resistance with a small cone penetrometer. So I will say that the effect of root reinforcement by root intrusion is relatively small and will mainly explain that with a change of soil uh, structure in particular aggregate stability and uh, due to the wetting drying cycle induced by vegetation. And that's possibly a little bit related. There's a comment from the or a uh, question from Lionel, which you could maybe respond directly to him about uh, strength and um, root exudates maybe related to that. So, yeah. so I'd better pass it back to Tim now. <laughs> okay, thanks, Lynn. Okay, so thanks, David, and thanks everyone for contributing to that session. That's the end of that session now. We we're going to move on to the the main event, and I'll pass over to Glyn, who's going to uh, who's, who's going to introduce the uh, the yep. medal lecture, and I'll I'll be fielding the questions while uh, while we do that. So, set if you want to send questions directly to me, do. So, I'd just like to. Um...